Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's a lovely day out there, and, and we're really thrilled to have such great weather for, for a celebratory weekend. Uh, so thank you for coming to, to listen in on this conversation with Professor Mario Molina. Um, I'm Lee Park. I'm in the chemistry department here, and I have the very great honor of introducing Professor Molina to you. Um, Professor Molina is known for his work in atmospheric chemistry, uh, studying the fate of various gaseous molecules uh, that persist in the atmosphere, and in particular for his part in elucidating the, the series of reactions and chemical mechanisms uh, that, that result in destruction of the ozone layer. Uh, and he was re recognized for this work, his part in this work, with the Nobel Prize in 1995. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to hear a little bit more about that as we talk today. But I thought I would uh, provide a little bit of biographical information first. Um, Professor Molina was born in Mexico City, and he, he developed his interest in chemistry early, uh, I understand, with an assist from an aunt who helped him set up a laboratory in, in a spare bathroom in the family home. Um, he did his undergraduate work in, in Mexico City uh, in physical chemistry, and then he went to Berkeley uh, to do his uh, doctoral work, and he worked in the lab of George Pimentel. Uh, so for those of you who are chemists in the audience, you'll, you'll recognize that name. George Pimentel is well known for his, his research, uh, broad, area of res broad areas of research, but also for his, his uh, deep commitment to education. And I think in both those arenas, he was a big influence on Professor Molina's early, early career. Uh, so during that time, Professor Molina was, was working on understanding energetic, the energetics and dynamics of various chemical and photochemical uh, reactions uh, and studying transient species, short-lived species. Uh, after he finished his doctoral work, he moved to UC Irvine, uh, where he joined the lab of uh, Professor Sherwood Rowland. Uh, and his work there is, is the work where, that he's best known for. Uh, they were studying uh, the fate of chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, uh, a group of seemingly simple molecules that were widely used industrially and that persist in the atmosphere, and they were, and it, and they were at the time accumulating in the atmosphere. And so uh, he worked on understanding uh, what happens to those molecules uh, in the atmosphere and leading to, the, to our, our fundamental understanding of the role of those molecules in the destruction of the ozone layer. Uh, after his postdoc, he jo joined the faculty at UC Irvine uh, and, and later moved to the Jet Propuls Pro Propulsion Lab, JPL, at Caltech. And he continued his work studying uh, different kinds of gaseous species uh, that, that exist in the atmosphere, and in particular developing uh, methods for uh, simulating in the laboratory the effect of clouds uh, on some of those chemical reactions, so really the effect of ice crystals on catalytic gas phase reactions. And a lot of that work then led to our understanding not only of uh, uh, the depletion of the, the chemical react reactions that take place in the ozone layer, layer but also the seasonal depletion of the ozone, ozone layer. Uh, so Professor Molina was instrumental in not only unraveling the scientific puzzle, this very intricate, complex scientific puzzle of those, that reaction chemistry, but also in, ra in raising public awareness of that and, and bringing, bringing those, those uh, ideas to the public and eventually to government. And so he's had a big impact on policy implications uh, over the years. Though the initial work was met with some skepticism uh, from, I think, both scientists as well as industry, uh, in the mid-'80s, that work was vindicated when scientists were able to, to um, obtain direct evidence for the actual depletion of the ozone layer. And eventually, this, this work, of course, had a, a profound impact on society, leading to the adoption of the Montreal uh, uh, Protocol of 1987. He's since held faculty positions at MIT and at UC San Diego, and he now splits his time between San Diego and the Mario Molina Center for uh, Energy and the Environment in Mexico City. He's been awarded numerous prizes from the scientific community. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the Mexican Academy of Sciences. He has an asteroid named after him. Uh, and of course, uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1995. Uh, that was the only Nobel Prize awarded for work in environmental research. Um, he, of course, has also had such a profound impact on, on the, the societal uh, policy. He's been awarded many, many awards from the environmental community as well, as well as the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, he used his Nobel Prize money to establish the Molina Center for Energy and Environment in Mexico City, 
uh, which is a center uh, that trains young scientists uh, and has turned its attention in particular to uh, issues of air pollution in cities around the world, as well as issues uh, associated with climate change more generally. So I thought I would get us started with a few questions, uh, but we hope also to open it up to questions from the audience. And I know that we're on a schedule and people have, have other events to get to, so we'll make sure that we end on time. So Professor Molina, can you tell me a little bit about, uh, I'm always impressed when I hear about scientists who set up home laboratories when they were children, but I am, <laughs> I am equally impressed that their parents let them do that. So <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about what you were doing as a child? Sure, 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 I will. First, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. It's really nice. Sure, let me tell you uh, how that happened, actually, as, as a very young child, uh, 10 years old, 11, maybe. I, like other children, just like to read pirate novels, things like that. But eventually, I discovered some biographies uh, of famous scientists. And uh, it was a thrill for me. And so I decided to ask, as, Christmas toys, chemistry sets, and microscopes, and so on. So I, it was fascinating for me. Uh, and somehow or other, there was a bathroom in, in, in our house that was not used because uh, it was in the middle of two parts of the house. So I, I just took over. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after I started doing experiment, then what my an aunt, my father's uh, sister, she was actually a chemist, and when she realized that I was interested in doing experiments. Uh, then what was very nice is to work with her to do much more sophisticated experiments. Well, I was about 12 years old or so at that time, and we started doing the experiments at first year college students. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, that, so that's how I got very, very enthused. The only uh, difficulty I had is that that was quite unusual. So I had lots of friends, but none of my friends liked it things that had to do with school. Uh -huh. So it was only much later that uh, I started to share sort of this joy with other fellow students or so. But anyhow, that, that's how things started. And already at that time, I remember, I thought, gee, it would be great if I could become a scientist and do research, even if it might have to be as a hobby, because I didn't realize you could earn a living doing that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it all started. All yes. right. Now, you also went abroad, I think, for some of your early schooling. That, that's right, yes. I, the, my parents uh, uh, had this idea of sending us. We were, uh, my, they sent my older sisters to Canada to learn a language, in that case, French and English. My older brother, who's a lawyer, he, he went to a school close to Boston. But I, I, they sent me to Switzerland because I like chemistry, and German was supposed to be already something that chemists were Should supposed learn. to know. <laughs> so, so I was in a boarding school in Switzerland for, for a couple of years. And again, there, I, my first uh, thought was, wow, I'll be in Europe, so I, uh, now I will have friends who like chemistry as well. And I was very disappointed. <laughs> 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 that didn't happen, but fortunately, I had some very good teachers that realized that I was very interested, and again, I could, they, they treated me quite well, and I could do experiments and study. Even mathematics, I discovered uh, mathematics there as well. So that was great, and I had my usual set of friends, but we didn't do uh, didn't talk school things with, with them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, so then, OK, so after you went abroad and, and did some studying, you came back and you did your undergraduate work in Mexico. That's right. right. That's okay. right. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you have a chance to get in, involved in research then? No. In in, uh, in Mexico, normally as an undergraduate, you don't do research. I mean, the, the I was at the National University, UNAM, we call it Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. It has something like 150,000 students. Okay. So just the School <laughs> of Chemistry, we were about 15,000 or so. So fairly large classes. Okay. We had to do some uh, practice, some experiments, but not as research, just uh, in analytical chemistry mm -hmm. and the sort of things I had done as a much younger. You'd already done all child. that. I had already done quite a bit. But I, so I didn't do research. I, the, the idea for many of, of those students was that they had enough time 
to work, at least part-time, mm -hmm. because many could not afford being at the university. So we had quite a bit of spare time, actually, even though we had to take many classes, but we had spare time. So I did start a little company with some of my, a few of okay. my friends, and we were able to patent the production of a catalyst, which was used to, to make a, a, a plastic foam. Oh. And in Mexico, it was sort of strange, because at that time, you know how uh, international trade works. At that time, if you were manufacturing something in Mexico, you could, uh, the, the way we describe it, close the border. In Mexico, they had, they had to buy these things from you. So there were we as students controlling a, what was a sizable sector of industry making plastic foam for mattresses and for everything. Fortunately, it did work <laughs> because it was just a catalyst, uh -huh. a, a very small amount. And so that was my research experience, okay. actually inventing something. Uh -huh. and so I did manage to continue. But of course, then I had decided already to uh, get a PhD and do real research eventually, which is what I did at Berkeley. Then. Right. Now, I think there was something also uh, that I read where you actually started a department? Uh, well, in, in spite of the size, the, at that time the university was mostly undergraduate students. Mm -hmm. So indeed, in, in, I studied chemical engineering, by the way, because I was already quite interested in physical chemistry, but that did not exist as such. Mm -hmm. So chemical engineers were the ones that did more math and physical chemistry, mm -hmm. as opposed to pharmaceutical chemistry, if you want. Mm -hmm. And so I did have a chance to start the master's degree in chemical engineering, uh, because it, it's at that time, it, it's only then that research also started at this national university. Now it's a more normal university with most faculty uh, being full-time and doing research. But when I was a student, most of my professors were actually working in industry. They were just teaching one class as a, as a hobby. So they were, they were not involved mm -hmm. in research. So yes, I was in some sense lucky to be part of this movement that started this big change. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And of course now it's, it's uh, a more, much more normal uh, right. looking university. Right. So after that, I think before you went to Berkeley, you actually went back to Germany, is that right? That's right, that's right. I f first thought I would get a PhD in, in Germany because I had learned German, but the, I, uh, the problem is I needed something much more flexible than the German type mm -hmm. university because I was a chemical engineer and I needed to learn a lot of physical chemistry. Quantum mechanics, of course, was totally unknown for chemical engineers at that time. And so I just got a master's. I was actually doing polymer chemistry. I was already uh, working with catalysts and so on. But then uh, shortly after uh, beginning my studies in Germany, I decided, no, I'd rather do my <laughs> PhD in the United States. And may, maybe things have changed in Germany as well, because mm -hmm. you could only see the Herr Professor at the beginning of your studies. He would give you a bunch of books and tell you, come and see me next year and see how you're doing. And whereas in, in the US, as you do here, of course, if you are doing graduate research, you a work very closely. Yeah. And I, had a, I was very lucky because with uh, George Pimentel, mm -hmm. I could, of course, uh, Learn a lot from him and had a lot of a very close interaction, as you mentioned, with science as well as with the sort of educational mm -hmm. issues. But uh, yes, I decided to uh, to do my my uh, PhD at Berkeley, and actually I was also very lucky because we had invited as there's a connection as part of this graduate program, we had invited. Uh, a couple of professors, one or two of them, from Berkeley, just to help us get started. And so they got to know a, a group of ah, us. We, okay. we were maybe three or four students. Mm -hmm. And that's why we got admitted, because we were the first bunch of Mexican students admitted to Berkeley. That was unheard of before. No? And so th th that's how things started. So they knew you then. And so I was lucky and then could do my mm -hmm. PhD work over there. Mm -hmm. 
So, okay, so you were, you were at Berkeley working in George Pimentel's group, and, and you were working uh, with chemical lasers uh, right. to, yes. study, to study chemical reaction dynamics. Um, and, and I've read that, that that was a moment that also inspired you to start thinking a little bit about the greater social impact of, of various areas of research. That's right. That's right? right. Yeah. And it was the, the interesting times at Berkeley, the student movement. It was in the late 60s, 69, 70, uh, People's Park, and all, all sorts of things were happening <laughs> there at that time. And interestingly, we, in, in this uh, laboratory with George Pimentel was in the basement because we had optical experiments that had to be very stable. Mm -hmm. But when the community of, well, there were lots of hippies at the time, if you want, a lot of very <laughs> active students, they learned that there was a group in, in chemistry working mm -hmm. with chemical lasers, and they thought we were developing them as weapons. <laughs> <laughs> and so they wanted to close our lab. So they didn't realize it was very basic, very fundamental research. Mm -hmm. So since we were in the basement, we managed to hide or to <laughs> <close> things. <laughs> But I did become aware of, of uh, social issues. But it was actually later that uh, it, at, at, at Irvine that I really sort of combined basic research with uh, uh, an environmental issue. Because it was not really on purpose, but that working with Cherry Rowland, we decided to do some basic science, ask a very a, a question out of cur just curiosity, what happens to certain chemical compounds, and then realized later that it had social implications, and that's how I really made the connection between mm -hmm. basic science and uh, social mm -hmm. issues. So can you talk now a little bit about, uh, so really the history of chlorofluorocarbons, what they were being used for, sure. why they were well, used so widely? Okay, I'll try to be very brief because we would like to let you, if people also ask some questions, it could be a long story. Let me try to be very brief. These this industrial compounds had been developed. They actually had been invented by, mainly by one chemist, also was a group of chemists called Thomas Midgley. And the idea was the following. Earlier in the 20th century, uh, refrigerators came about, electrical refrigerators. That was a big change because up to then, people had freezers at home, but they had to import large chunks of ice from northern frozen lakes. Okay. So this was a big issue, but there were a number of accidents that happened with those early refrigerators because the, the fluid that we were using was either ammonia mm -hmm. or sulfur dioxide, which mm -hmm. is sort of quite poisonous. Yeah. So it was a very big invention to be able to synthesize these chemicals that were not natural, the, the, the derivatives of methane and ethane. So you replace the hydrogen atoms with, with, with mm -hmm. halogens. And so they were called miracle chemicals. And they were so good that they were also, they found other applications as, as propellants in mm -hmm. spray cans. Mm -hmm. And so they were uh, accumulating in the atmosphere very small amounts, parts per trillion, but that's when we just decided to ask the question, what happens right. to them? And then working with, Cherry Rowland was not an atmospheric chemist. We both decided we wanted to learn about the atmosphere and a good way to learn about a new field is to ask a question. Fortunately, we. We were lucky and asked a very interesting question about these compounds. And in learning about it, we realized that they would decompose in the stratosphere. And, and there, the decomposition products, of course, would, in contrast to the original molecules, are free radicals. Mm -hmm. uh, not like the students in Berkeley, but <laughs> like chemical free radicals <laughs> that have an odd number of electrons and so on. So they, they, we knew that there were some catalytic reactions mm -hmm. and so on. And so the idea was that very small amounts of this uh, catalyst uh, were capable of destroying large amounts of, mm -hmm. of ozone, which is predominantly made in the stratosphere, shielding, of course, the surface of the mm -hmm. planet from ultraviolet radiation. So in, in, in short, that was what we did as a hypothesis, because nothing uh, had happened to the ozone layer at that time. But it, it was already been studied mostly by uh, physicists and atmospheric dynamicists, not by chemists, because they try to understand how ozone moves, because it's mostly made at tropical latitudes, but it ends up, because it goes to lower altitudes, it ends up, ends up at the poles. Mm -hmm. So they were a little annoyed that we 
came up there and saying that chemistry is also important <laughs> and, and does affect this, uh, this uh, very important layer. And so that, that's how it, uh, mm -hmm. it really came about. But perhaps just another minute, a very important, that was the first part of the story. And of course, we had to do experiments in the lab measuring the rate constants for these catalytic reactions and so on. But then the ozone hole was discovered over Antarctica. And it, it's, what happens is in the spring months, which is when the light begins to come out, which is uh, September, October, of course, it's six months out of phase, uh, there's a polar vortex in Antarctica and ozone begins to disappear. And in a matter of uh, weeks, at those altitudes where it's mostly most abundant, in a matter of weeks, 99% or more disappears. Okay, so that, that's something we had not initially mm -hmm. predicted. But as you mentioned, with, with these uh, uh, ice crystals that only form there, because Antarctica, it, as opposed to the Arctic, which is a, a flat part of the planet surrounded by continents, on the south, it's the other way around. You have a high continent surrounded by an ocean, so the vortex is very stable, and it gets colder. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have polar stratospheric clouds, a little bit of ice, and that's what catalyzes the conversion of stable. It, it's not the original molecules. It's hydrogen chloride, chlorine nitrate. They react on these surfaces and make molecular chlorine, which is a yellow gas. Mm -hmm. So in the spring, it uh, photolyzes free chlorine atoms that are the ones that catalyze ozone mm -hmm. extremely rapidly. And that's, and that's why it, it, it did not happen. The, the ozone hole started to appear mm -hmm. in the, in, at, at that time. Uh, but laboratory experiments showed very clearly that that could happen. But then the real test was doing experiments over Antarctica with airplanes and measuring uh, what was happening, and there was an almost perfect anti-correlation between the, the concentration of these radicals and the disappearance of ozone, so that was a smoking gun. And that, that really settled the, mm -hmm. the theory. And in parallel, there was this international effort to try to do something about it. And with the ozone hole and the science being so clear, the five or six large chemical industries that were initially opposed, of course, to doing anything about it, without how why should we do something uh, connected to the hypothesis? But when the science became very clear, they agreed. The DuPont company was the main one, and they had made a commitment to stop manufacturing these compounds. If the science became clear, it happened. And so that's how the Montreal Protocol mm -hmm. came about. And internationally, all the countries of the planet essentially agreed not to manufacture. Mm -hmm. You make compounds. it sound, sound very easy, but... <laughs> <can you laughs> well, it took some time. I'm <laughs> compressing it right. a lot, but... Can you talk a little bit about, you know, when those initial papers were published, sort of the skepticism and right, getting right. to the point where, where the public understood that and, and you actually were able to right. impact policy? That, that was quite interesting because at that time it was not that common for scientists to become involved with mm -hmm. sort of science policy issues. In fact, we, I remember a few fairly well-known scientists that did like to make a lot of noise and publish in the New York Times and so on. And they were not very well regarded by the community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had to fight a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, we were able to convince other scientists that the, the science was right. And there were no environmental organizations at that time that would somehow or other pay attention to to this particular type of issues because they were beginning to worry about forest and biodiversity and so on, but not atmospheric chemistry. Mm -hmm. So I remember with Sherry Rowland really just sitting down discussing, what shall we do? Well, we know it's, it's not very, very widely accepted by the community, but if it is not us, then who? And if it's not when? Now, mm -hmm. okay, so we started we uh, started to talk about it first in American Chemical Society meetings, but then to the media, and when we went to, the, to talk to decision makers in government. And so it was quite an effort, which initially was, of course, not uh, along the same line of uh, thinking as industry, as I was saying, but eventually it all came together. Mm -hmm. But yes, that was uh, sort of uncommon 
but it was a, 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 an explicit decision to mm -hmm. deal with this, with it. And if you are a socially responsible person, then you can do it. And I remember, I still do that when I now working much more with climate change issues, but just explaining, look, science doesn't tell you what to do, whether it doesn't tell you if it's good or bad. It just tells you what happens if you do this or that. But as an individual, you can have opinions and you have values and you want to protect society. That doesn't follow from science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yes, if you're explicit about it, it, it's okay. You're talking as an individual, not mm -hmm. as a scientist, when you are pushing this ideas. Mm -hmm. So did you feel that you had to learn a different set of skills to, to talk to the oh, yes. policy people? Yes, very, very much so, because we normally tend to talk in fairly obscure language <laughs> to, to the extent that organic chemists don't talk to physical chemists. That's right. <laughs> so yes, you have, to, you have to be able to translate that. Fortunately, we, had to, we were able to meet with several good communicators, and they even wrote some books and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's difficult. The scientific community normally is not trained and does not communicate science clearly. And by the way, this is just a very big issue mm -hmm. nowadays with climate change, because it's, uh, this is way ahead at the end of the story, if you want. But we're now working with professional communicators, mm -hmm. people that do experiments, doing uh, Surveys, they, they communicate ideas to samples of several thousand people and so on, and see how they perceive what you say. And if as a scientist you just improvise, it, it, uh, it often doesn't, doesn't well. work. <laughs> right. So, so that is actually part of the training then, for instance, that you give young scientists now uh, who are working on climate change issues to right. learn well, how to communicate that. Right, what, yeah. what I do, to young people, many of them are naturally sort of involved with social issues. Mm -hmm. Many of them are very interested. And again, I just explained this idea I was telling you about, that one thing is science, the other one are social issues. But that you have to be able to, to communicate properly. By the way, what I tell students also, if they are science students, uh, their first job is to be very good in their own field, so mm -hmm. go as deeply as they can there. And of course, then it's, if you want to deal with some societal issues like this, you also have to learn to communicate to scientists in other disciplines, and that, that's already a, a task, to economists to, and even to politicians. So, mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's something you learn by doing it. Right. So it's, that's great. Um, so I have other questions about sort of current work, but maybe, maybe we can actually just open it up and let, let people in the audience ask those questions or others, so. Yes, somebody, sure. I get probably a letter a week from some environmental organization describing these kinds of things. I can't discriminate between one organization and another. They all are busy raising money by scaring me to death. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the citizen to do? Yes, okay, here. So here. I think that yeah. they would like us to repeat the question, so I will try to repeat the question, okay. so that there are environmental organizations oh, that proceed. proliferate and, and uh, are asking for money and asking for support, but so how is an average citizen supposed to respond or discriminate among those? Yeah, and some of them actually try to scare you and so on. Yeah. Okay, then let me tell you what, what I think but I'm going to connect it with climate change, which is the current uh, sort of perhaps the biggest challenge that society it has faced, certainly connected to an environmental issue. Uh, here is what happens. There are not only environmental organizations, there are all sorts of blogs and industry groups. They also try to tell you that this is all a hoax, okay? <laughs> that nothing is real. So, so he, here is very briefly how it, uh, it happens the sort of things that that would advise you to do. First of all, there has been a very clear effort, very well financed and documented. There's actually a movie now called The Merchants of Doubt by uh, the historian who used to be in San Diego, Naomi Oreskes, that explains that but documents it properly. Anyhow, this uh, well-funded public relations effort uh, is carried out 
so that the media, they do it mostly with the media and with the public at large, uh, is doubtful. They say, look, some scientists think this way, some other scientists think that other way. They did the same thing with tobacco mm -hmm. and the same thing with flame retardants, and it was all wrong, and they knew it. It's really, really dishonest, but it's well documented. Why? Because, since this happened some years ago, there have been a number of, of uh, uh, scientific documents, if you want, papers, of sociologists, historians, and others who have actually done the sampling. Okay, so you sample papers that have something or other to do with climate change, and it turns out that more than 97% of them agree that climate change is happening, and it's mostly, it's not absolutely certain, but it's most likely caused by human activities. Okay. So the, 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 the mix-up is on purpose, and it's, it has worked very well because they've done that before, and it's the same people, actually. They contract some of the spe people that specialize there. Now, how can you tell? Well. The thing to do is to read, perhaps, if you want to, to, to get the best opinions. You, you, you can get reports, for example, from the National Academy of Sciences, which is a very well-respected organization. Why? Because it supports the sort of science that we all enjoy. That's why we have high standards of living. Okay? Because how was it? If you go back at the history of, of a cell phone, how many scientific inventions does it require? Well, but these are all very well-known scientists now. So you know how the scientific community works internationally and so on. So you can follow the, the, the organizations that are responsible for these sort of things. Also the American Physical Society and so on and so forth. Or you can read the consensus of these 97% of experts when they try to summarize. For example, I did a, a project with the AAAS. That's the organization that publishes the journal Science. And I did get together, I put together a group of roughly 15 very well-known climate scientists. And we put together a document. It was not easy because, precisely what you said, there is the other side of the coin, some organizations that scare you or that exaggerate or whatever. So the idea is, how do you, can you do this very honestly? Yes. And so this document, we, we generated the document that's called What We Know, and it's a consensus of these very well-known scientists, hopefully without the exaggerations. But the bottom line, unfortunately, is not good news. It's not meant to scare, but it just talks about risks. So it's because climate change is a, a complex issue, you cannot be certain of your projections for the next few decades, but you can be certain of what has happened already. Okay, that's very clear. There are lots of measurements. The basic science is very well established and so on. So there, there's little doubt about that. And that, that's what is documented in some of these uh, uh, stories, how the basic science is, is really not in question. Carbon di dioxide absorbs in the infrared. Well, that was not already in the 19th century and things like that. Swante Arrhenius already had projected that, mm -hmm. that uh, the temperature would go up, and so that, that part is well explained. So anyhow, I'm summarizing. It's not trivial because you can go to the uh, in the internet and find whatever you, <laughs> <laughs> you want. So you have to trust uh, societies, groups, that, uh, particularly those that are connected with the international scientific establishment that is the one that makes sure that science advances. Okay. It's, there are all sorts of questions. We always like to be at the frontier of science, and that's why we are skeptics by nature, but some science is very well established. Okay. Just think, let me exaggerate for a second. Who, it, if we go back a century, when, when uh, uh, Boltzmann had some difficulties because the question then was, do molecules really exist? I mean, that, that's, that was a big question, and, and, and uh, you had to do experiments and so on. But nowadays, who would claim that molecules don't exist? <laughs> I mean, you can see them and so on. So there are lots of aspects of science 
that are extremely well documented, including quantum mechanics, which is extremely weird. Okay, so, so there's no question about these issues. Okay, very well settled. But there is a question about exactly what will happen. Working with economists, they tell, don't worry, what society does is work with risks, so you would minimize risks. That's, that's how you make decisions, what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry for the very long answer, but it was a very important question. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. So, so was there a moment in your lab when you thought to yourself, this is really important that you need to get it out? So, uh, so the question is, was there a moment yes. uh, during your research when you realized how important uh, what you were working on was and that you needed to get the information out? Uh, it, with the stratospheric ozone, indeed, yes, I, I remember it. Uh, so, because we were asking a question out of curiosity. But we, at that time, it, uh, uh, atmospheric chemistry was just being developed. So our colleague Paul Crutzen, who shared the Nobel Prize with us, at that time had already sort of speculated and later was measured that very small amount of natural nitrogen oxides control the, the natural levels of, of, of ozone. So we had some indications that it was feasible. So when, when I realized and then discussed it with Sherry Rowland, I mean, we really worked together. Wow, this, there is a possibility that this Thing might happen, then we'd say, well, what the hell should we do? The first thing we did was, we didn't go to the press, of course, we went to the scientific community. Surprisingly, the scientific community of experts, they all reacted very positively and very fast. It was a larger community of scientists say, well, this, you, can, you don't normally don't uh, expect uh, mm -hmm. that uh, society can have a, an impact on, on the functioning of the entire planet. That's sort of not, not very likely. The same thing when the, when the ozone hole first was measured. The, the first reaction, even from, not, not from many chemists, because they were already working with us, but from many atmospheric dynamics, this, this must be natural. It's just too big to be caused by humans. Okay. But yes, we realized that this had this potential. And then we reinforced by our colleagues saying, yeah, it's possible. Let's go and measure it. <laughs> uh, and that, that's when it happened. And it's not the way things happen with climate change. When Arrhenius, Swante Arrhenius, a very famous chemist, many of us know him for because of the rate constants, and he got a Nobel Prize also, but that's for electrolysis, OK, right. discovered electrolysis. And so, but he also worked with climate change, surprisingly. And he, in, at the beginning of the 20th century, had already pr predicted that uh, carbon dioxide would accumulate because fossil fuels were there, and that this would increase the temperature of the planet. But in contrast to what mm -hmm. we concluded, he thought that would be good for the planet to get a little warmer. He was, of course, living in Sweden. <laughs> so that's the only thing he got wrong, okay? And then it would, people, well, the scientific community didn't pay much attention. It was much later than the problem got slowly picked up again. I think from the perspective of, of the way things work now, it's remarkable to me that, that you were able to get the attention of not just the scientific community, but the broader community, because it's only now that we're, we were just talking about a recent paper, it's only now that we're actually seeing evidence that the ozone layer is, is in fact being repaired. So it, it's, it's a very slow process, uh, you know, once that damage has been done. And it's a little hard to imagine in this, at this moment in time, proposing something with that long an induction period. Uh, right, right. For... And, and to repeat it, when we first proposed it, the ozone layer was uh, fine. Not yeah. much was happening. Yeah. So first, it was measurable that it began to, to, to change in mm -hmm. that middle latitudes. But it was uh, the ozone hole, of course, was. Yes. And by the way, just a brief story about the ozone hole, also just to tell you how the community functions. The, the ozone hole was actually discovered by some colleagues of ours from the British Antarctic Survey. Mm -hmm. How did they do that? Well, it's ozone 
shields uh, ultraviolet light. You measure ultraviolet light, and you can tell how much ozone was there. And they were doing some experiments over Antarctica just to see how ozone moved and so on. And suddenly they began to see in the spring when the sun began to, to come out because they had to spend the night there a few months in the dark. Okay? And then when the light came out, they could begin to measure. And it was in, in the 1980s that uh, they saw over, the, over a few years how the ozone hole appeared because it was not there before. And then they published it and talking to us, they speculated it might have to do something with our findings. But here, is the, here was a dilemma at that time. Ozone had been measured with satellites mm -hmm. because, again, of these movements. And the satellites had not talked about the ozone holes. Well, something was wrong. So that's why they were sort of cautious in terms of uh, their experiments, but they were very clear. Well, you know what was happening is that the satellites measuring also had been programmed to ignore data if the values were half the normal values. And they thought that would be a mistake, probably. So fortunately, you could go back to the original data, and lo and behold, the ozone hole was there. Okay? But it was not discovered mm -hmm. by the satellites. Yeah. So that, it was spectacular okay, that uh, such a thing would, would happen. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. And with climate change, just coming back to your question, what's happening is that uh, we have extreme events now that for, for some years the scientific community very cautiously was, wasn't quite ready to say mm -hmm. if it had anything to do with climate change. But now it's quite clear that not that these events are caused by climate change, but their intensity is clearly affected and statistically it's increased. And clearly heat waves are the easiest ones to assess because you can measure that from satellites. So that, that very clearly that has shifted. And that's why people are beginning to die, actually, as you see in, in, in India. I mean, when the temperature reaches mm -hmm. close to 50 degrees centigrade, you cannot survive. Okay? And it's getting close to that. Mm -hmm. We had a pretty cold summer last summer here in the Northeast. We were exceptional throughout the world. I hope that's not a new normal. Do you happen to know? <laughs> <laughs> Can we expect warmer summers in Williamstown? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a very good question also. Here's what happens. Originally, the whole issue was called global warming. But in the community, among us, we decided that the much better description is climate change. Because the, 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 the net warming is relatively small. It's less than a degree centigrade, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, if you average uh, everything over the planet. That doesn't seem to be much. But as an average, it's actually quite significant. But that just means that the climate is changing. So because the circulation changes, then you get the eastern part of the US very cold and the western part very dry and so on. So that, and that you can begin to explain also with, with physics, with atmospheric dynamics. What you can measure is there's more energy in, in the atmosphere, of course, there's less when it gets very cold, but that's because it gets isolated. And so so it, that's why these extreme events, whichever way they go, they just become more extreme in general. But those are changes in the circulation of the atmosphere. But overall, it is the, it's warming. Okay, the, the, the Arctic is melting in the summers and and, uh, and so on. And by the way, there were some measurements, some idea that the temperature had stabilized. And that, if you look at it for a short, some period of time, it's only the long term that counts. But ironically, what happens now, Tom Carl of NOAA and so on, they found out it's, it's quite difficult to measure the average. Mm -hmm. And they were not measuring it correctly, so it actually has been increasing all the time. So this so-called hiatus is, is Mm -hmm. is, it was wrong. You know? mm -hmm. So that's striking also. It, it, the climate has been changing now for quite some a number of years now. I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about so the success of the Montreal Protocol and the, the action of chemical companies. Do you think that if you compare chlorofluorocarbons to climate change, is 
Is the problem in getting action now, is it just that the, the actual issue is so different, or do you feel like there's something different either in the political sphere or industrial right. sphere yeah. that's making this harder? Yeah, that's also a very good question because often we say, what can we learn from the Montreal Protocol? And, so, and, and you're right. The issue was simpler. As I said before, we were dealing with a small number of big chemical industries that were rational. So at some point, they accepted the science. By the way, they were funding a lot of science initially. And I, was, uh, I didn't get funding from them, but I went to all their meetings. Mm -hmm. And to their disappointment, most of what they funded came out in our side, mm -hmm. okay. but they were willing to accept it. And mm -hmm. But climate change is different because it involves the use of energy, which is so pervasive, okay, and it's so important for economic development. Uh, but in principle, you could say, well, th things could have worked in, in, in a similar way to some extent, people accepting us, but it became politicized. Mm -hmm. And the, I, ironically, this, uh, you know this uh, issue I was describing before that uh, these investments to uh, question the science that were very successful, it turns out that a few scientists, but very few, just a handful, were involved, but the same scientists were the ones that were questioning the stratospheric ozone and also smoking. And what, what is interesting is that when you look a little further, and these scientists are politically very motivated. They are libertarians. So they just cannot tolerate that the government should tell you what to do about anything. And they come out explicitly about that. That's why they call us uh, um, melons, because we are green on the outside, but you call it that we are red in the inside, because, because we're all socialists, OK? Mm. We <laughs> because we want the government to change. That, that, it, that's so politically motivated, of course, because we, many of our scientists have, I mean, you, we might have our own political ideas, but we're certainly not motivated by socialism, okay, for, for this, but they were very strongly for that. But that's one part. The other part, it's, you know, one of the bottlenecks in the US is, is well, it, it's very clear, it's just the, the, the uh, Congress, Okay, and it's the Tea Party and so on, the Republicans, a little bit because of the same idea that the, the, the worry that the government would impose things on you. Okay? And so they accepted these ideas that this whole thing was first that it was a hoax, then that it maybe it was there but it didn't matter, and then yeah, now okay. Finally, Congress accepted that the temperature is changing, but not that it's due to human activities, okay? So it's very politicized. But it's, to me, it's, it's really irrational. It's still like living in, in the age of astrology because it doesn't go with basic evidence-based science. Okay? And so that's a big problem, but it's beginning to change. And so the public opinion is beginning to shift and there are some Republicans, I'm working with them, but not the ones that are in Congress now, former Republicans that are very active trying to change uh, things. Okay. Uh, Republicans that were active as, uh, in, in, in government, as, as in, in uh, foreign relations or, or the Treasury or so, like Hank Paulson, okay, he was Secretary of the Treasury. And the Bloomberg is, is part of this. And so, so it's not all Republicans. It's just that it, it became a little bit a, a party mantra. It's not accepted yet in a Republican Congress uh, meeting to accept climate change. Okay, that's, that's not the proper thing to do. So it's, it's uh, more social than scientific. And that's a big difference with with stratospheric ozone. Fortunately, we were able to avoid that part. One more interesting point of that is that the Montreal Protocol has uh, resources, uh, a fund to help developing nations to, to adapt to the newer technologies, because many of them were not using 
spray cans yet and so on. Not yet. And there was a worry, wow, that's going to affect the economy. It's a lot of money. It, it didn't. It was a relatively small amount of funds went a long way. But the United States at that time was worried this would set a precedent. But they accepted it, the multilateral fund. And it has been very successful. And that's part of the discussion with climate change as well. There should be some international fund. It doesn't have to be huge and so on. But the very big change, as opposed to some years ago, is that countries like China are no longer pushing what was called the Kyoto Protocol. And to say, you guys in the West, you are the ones that cause the problem. So you solve it first, and then we'll follow. Things don't work that way, because developing countries Emerging economies are also having uh, emissions even more now. China emits even more than the U.S., so they changed, and they have made commitments now. And the, you know, the U.S. and China have a joint uh, release that they will do things. So, that, so that's uh, the, the very positive, and is much more along the lines of the Montreal Protocol. So we're getting near the end of our time. So maybe, maybe I'll just ask you uh, if you have any words of advice for our graduating seniors. And oh, for the, <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, the first word of advice, even if we're sitting up here, when I was looking at the chairs, I thought we're supposed to be actors and not necessarily tell the truth. If <laughs> 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 but no, <laughs> we're not acting, hopefully. <laughs> what I would tell the graduating seniors is, uh, it's very important to be good at what you like. So do what you like with passion. Do it uh, forcefully. And if you can also benefit society, all the better. But make sure that you are very good at what you uh, like. Find what you like. And uh, keep doing it. But don't forget that we all have common values that we want humanity to continue to the uh, civilization. Fortunately, if you look at the overall history of civilization, it is moving forward. We still have wars, but less. We still have all sorts of problems, but hopefully less and less. There's still many poor people, but hopefully that's increasing. We just have to keep trying. Yeah. OK. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Um, please join me in thanking Professor Molina. Thank you.